Our guest presenter is Jennifer J. Gutierrez, Executive Director of RIT's world-renowned Image Permanence Institute. Jay became the Executive Director of the IPI in April 2017. IPI is an academic research laboratory within the College of Art and Design focused on research that supports the preservation of cultural heritage collections in libraries, archives, and museums around the world. Areas of expertise include the preservation of photographic materials and sustainable practices in preservation environmental management. Prior to her appointment at RIT, Jay was the Arthur J. Bell Senior Photograph Conservator at the Center for Creative Photography at University of Arizona, Tucson, where she established the institution's conservation department. Jay has affiliated faculty status in the Art Conservation Department at the University of Delaware, where she held a faculty appointment for eight years prior to working at the University of Arizona. At U Delaware, she taught undergraduate and graduate level courses in preventive conservation, conservation ethics, and the conservation of photographic materials. She also served as Associate Director of the Wintertour University of Delaware Program in Art Conservation, one of only four master's level conservation training programs in the United States. Jay is a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation and has a Master of Science in Art Conservation from the University of Delaware, specializing in photographic conservation. Jay, our audience is yours. Thank you, Lydia. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to have you with us, and I'm looking forward to spending the next hour with you. Sorry, there we go. So um, the goals for today's presentation, I'm going to say a little bit more about the Image Permanence Institute here at RIT and also introduce um, a variety of photographic materials to talk about how photographic processes vary in terms of materials and factors we have to consider when caring for them, and then um, spend the second half of the presentation really talking about um, tips for caring for your collections at home. So let's go ahead and get started saying a little bit more about IPI. The Image Permanence Institute was founded at RIT in 1985 as a joint initiative between um, the Institute and the then Society of Photographic Scientists and Engineers. And as our name suggests, our original focus was on um, image permanence and image stability. Um, but that has expanded into um, additional materials and also a focus on environmental management and environmental monitoring within cultural heritage institutions. So as Lydia already um, addressed, our primary goal is research that informs and supports the preservation of cultural heritage collections in libraries, archives, and museums. And so today I'm going to give you sort of a better sense of, of that work with the next couple of slides and the diversity of photographic materials, one of our areas of expertise, and then how we can take what we know and how we advise libraries, museums, and archives about caring for their collections and apply it at home. So um, a little bit about RIT proper. We're located in Gannett Hall of the College of Art and Design, and here you can see some of the laboratory spaces. Um, the lab in the upper left is our microscopy lab. This is where we do a lot of imaging of our study collection for research and also for creating practical tools, some of which I'll introduce later in the webinar, um, about photographic materials. The incubation lab, you see two images from that space at the center of the slide, represents really the heart of IPI. Um, in these incubation ovens, we can control temperature and humidity and do accelerated aging research as well as testing of materials to see if they're stable to be in contact with photographs or other um, paper-based collection materials. Um, we also have a, a lab dedicated to pollution studies, and then you can see our two classrooms, a webinar room, and the study collection um, to give you a better sense of the space. Currently, we consist of 14 full and part-time staff, and um, we're engaged in a wide variety of topics, primarily in three areas. The first um, is our research studies and projects. So again, here we focus on image and print media stability. 
Um, that's everything about photographic processes from the support to the image material. And all of the work that was done at IPI essentially in the 1980s and 1990s focused on photographic materials pointed to one of the most important things we have to do in cultural institutions to care for collections is manage the environment. Because temperature, humidity, and light can cause so many different forms of deterioration, chemical decay over time, we can control those factors. We can better preserve our materials long term. So that's where the focus on environmental management came in. And in the 21st century, our research has really focused on how do we make environmental management in cultural institutions sustainable. That is, how do we achieve the best preservation conditions for a collection at the most efficient cost? Um, one of our areas, other areas of research is testing and standards. Um, so we do do testing of materials to see if they comply with different ISO standards related to photographic materials. All of this research work then informs education and training activities. So what is the goal of the research? Um, to understand and answer questions of, about preservation and preservation challenges, and then to disseminate the results of that work um, in practical tools and education and training opportunities. So we do that through publications, as well as webinars and hands-on workshops. And um, this work is also supported by our products and services. So I'm going to introduce a couple of our web-based applications that, again, are primarily geared towards cultural institutions, but can help you with understanding your collections at home as well. Um, and we do consulting services where staff from IPI travel to libraries, archives, and museums around the country to help assess um, collection storage environments and actually the efficiency of mechanical systems and how to help um, maximize or optimize the preservation environments. So hopefully that gives you a better sense of what's going on here at IPI. And now I'm going to transition into um, talking about personal image collections. So I want to start by acknowledging that most of the images we make today, the vast majority really, are born digital. Um, some of you uh, in the audience today may still be shooting film. It's been a while since I have myself. Um, but research shows us that most of the images made annually are made on mobile phones. So this is an interesting snapshot of um, some figures that were put out by Tech Today in 2016, where they estimated based on trends from 2013 to 2016, that in, in 2017 we would make 1.2 trillion images. And 85% of those images would be made on mobile phones. Um, I can I say that my personal habits, most of my images are made on phones, but I'm also still taking digital cameras. And it's interesting to look at these figures because they don't even account for film-based um, materials anymore. So I want to acknowledge that most of the images we make are born digital, and um, there are lots of reasons to take electronic images. They're, they're quick. Um, we have the technology in our pockets, usually in our smartphone, right? And there are so many different ways that we can share these images today, right, with friends, family, colleagues. And so we are making more images than we have in the past. Um, but we're also making more images that maybe we didn't intend on making for long-term preservation or care um, in our family collections, per se. This is a small group of images that I collected from colleagues at IPI. I asked them for images that they'd recently taken on their phone that they had no intention in keeping, but they sort of had a one-time use, right? So a snapshot of a, of a fancy lunch date or um, a product that you want to remember when at a store. Um, we find ourselves, right, more and more we're taking images like this um, that have a one-time use. They're great for sharing and significant, um, but, but maybe not images that you expect or anticipate to go back to 10, 20, 30 years from now. In contrast, we are still making those types of images, right? So for the images that um, you're making of those special milestones, um, events, travel, um, trips that you do want to look back on, that you do want to share with future generations, you know, um, have, have prints um, to look at with your children or your grandchildren, nieces, nephews, others, um, I'm going to advocate today that you think about um, printing those particular images. 
and we're going to talk a little bit about why. I'm going to return to electronic images and managing electronic files at the end of this presentation, but here I'm going to transition to um, why I think making prints is important. So very, very important feature of um, having prints in your family collection is they're human readable. That's to say that when you want to care for um, a print collection, essentially you have to focus on preserving the print. And as long as the print is stored in a place um, where it's safe from certain forms of deterioration that we're going to talk about, um, you can access it at any time um, simply by picking up and looking at it. So if we take a look at um, some family albums that my mom assembled when I was growing up 40 years ago, here they are, three albums that most of the year sit on the shelf. Um, these are the classic magnetic albums that rarely you, you don't see these anymore. Um, the adhesives can be a problem, the plastic sheeting um, early on was a problem. Um, but here they are, three albums assembled during my childhood. And when we get together as a family, um, because these are human readable, all we need to do is pull them off the shelf and we can relive those memories, relive those moments, have those um, shared experiences again because these objects are human readable. In contrast, electronic images require both software and hardware to access, right? So in addition to preserving your image, essentially the electronic file, you also have, also have to make sure that you have the software and the hardware long-term to access them. Certainly this is doable, and again, I'm gonna to return to this at the end of the presentation, um, but I think what you'll find in terms of maintenance and the steps required to ensure that you can continue to access these images long term are a little bit more complicated. So, so let's um, do another example. If 40 years ago my mom had saved all of the images in those albums to um, some sort of electronic media storage at that time, maybe a three and a half inch floppy or three and a quarter inch, um, she might still have a box of those discs but if she hadn't done anything with those discs for 35, 30 years in between, um, she wouldn't be able to access those materials anymore. She wouldn't have the hardware to access um, that type of storage media or the software really. Um, so what, what is in, entailed in terms of caring for and preserving electronic images is you need to be prepared to make sure that they remain on media that are accessible, that you have hardware that can access um, the files. So um, this can be a little bit more tricky uh, than film, than um, caring for prints. And so again, I'm gonna advocate for those images that you think you really wanna go back to, you wanna have long-term, do consider making prints. And so um, that's sort of my first takeaway highlight of the day. And now what we're gonna do is Transition into talking a little bit about photographic materials. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this slide. Um, in terms of making prints, some of you are probably saying, what kind of prints should I make? And that's a, a little outside of the scope of this talk today. So what I do wanna do though is point you towards some consumer guides on IPI's website, and this is the URL where you can find these. And these um, guides are written for the general public as an audience. They provide information about the stability of different photographic materials, um, factors to consider when you're looking at contemporary or modern photographic papers. There's information about framing, some, some of the information we're gonna to cover today. And so these are great guides that you can download from our website for more information. And you're gonna find um, in the hour that we have, I'm going to sort of introduce several topics for you to think about and consider, but also try to point you towards resources where you can find more information on a particular topic of interest. Jay, we do have a question. Um, we're wondering if uh, important photos should be printed in a book like from Shutterfly. Is it worth that money? And are Shutterfly books safe from deterioration? <laughs> Great question. So um, I, I don't want to endorse any one particular type of material or vendor, but I certainly will endorse printing photo books um, of your collections. I think they are equivalent essentially to that, those magnetic albums I showed um, from several decades ago. It, um, the process of making a photo book requires you to organize your images and provide context it allows you to have a group of prints printed together and then you can care for them as a group. 
So it's a great way to preserve um, an event, an entire year. And um, in terms of, of um, choosing your materials, I would say when you're looking at these vendors, um, prints are still being made, um, prints, individual prints is chromogenic. Um, we get into the digital print technology with things like um, photo books, and um, the materials being used should be described on any vendor that you're looking at, and so you can look for that material information when you're considering where to print and compare it to the information available in the consumer guides. Great question, thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going now, moving on to talking about photographic materials. So start out with addressing, you know, the way that most of us are capturing images today. They're probably born digital. Um, we're going to want to think hard about printing those images that we, we um, really want to see in years ahead. And um, then talking about other photographic materials you might have in your collection, images that you have inherited maybe from other generations or current generations. Um, every family seems to sort of have an archivist, right, that person, that object sort of gravitate towards, maybe you're that person. Um, and I want to introduce um, some of the typical print processes you're most likely to have at home in your collections to give you a sense of the variety of materials photographs are made out of, as well as their vulnerabilities, before talking about how to display and store them. So this is probably the trickiest slide of the day um, in the presentation. Uh, if you look at the left of the slide, what I'm trying to illustrate there is if we are able to look under high magnification at the edge of a photographic print, so it's just a very fine edge, right, we could examine what that structure of the photograph is. And essentially, photographs have what we call laminate structures. They're often made up of multiple layers. And in some cases, when we get into the late 20th, 21st century, the layer structure of photographs can be very complicated. And in all photographic processes, it's the materials that the photograph itself are made out of that determine its vulnerabilities and its needs in terms of how to care for it. So these are five photographic processes that I'm gonna sort of tell you a little bit about to introduce from the 19th century to the 21st century and give you a sense of the variety of materials photographs are made out of. Now when I say that, here we're going to focus on five. There are over 30 different photographic processes um, that you could potentially have at home, but these are the most likely. So we'll start with the albumin print. I, I chose this process for the 19th century because it was the most common photographic process made in the 19th century. Here you're seeing what we call a cabinet card um, albumin print, and if you have 19th century photographs, of your family members on paper, they're most likely to be this process. So here, this is sort of a simple structure for a photograph. If we look at the cross section there on the left, um, we see two layers. That shiny, glossy, it almost looks like a bumpy layer is the paper itself. So this is what the paper of the photographic print looks like under magnification. Um, which these images are taken with a microscope at 200 times magnification. And then along the top of that paper layer, you can see a very thin coating. Um, this coating is made up of egg white or albumin. That's where the name of the process comes from. And then within that albumin layer, there are very, very fine photolytic silver particles that make up the image material. So when we look at dark image areas like the man's suit or the woman's dress, those areas have the greatest amount of photolytic silver present. And highlight areas, um, like their shirt, have very few silver particles. So what we see there instead is the color of the paper and the color of the albumin. In the 20th century, then, we switch to the dominant process being silver gelatin prints. And silver gelatin prints um, vary in a few ways from albumin prints. Here, again, the support is paper, because we're focusing on prints today. Um, but we see the introduction of a new material called baryta. That's a bright white layer um, in between the paper and the binder layer. And then the top binder is um, another protein, not egg white this time, but gelatin. And within that gelatin layer, we have small filamentary silver particles. They're still small overall. It takes tens of thousands of times magnification to see them um, with a microscope, but they're significantly larger than the photolytic silver that we see in albumin prints 
And so the color of these photographs is different because of the morphology of that silver. So we have true black and white images, like the, image, the photograph you see there on the left. Um, that said, we can also tone these images. And so the uh, print that you're seeing on the far right has been toned, probably sulfur tone, to give it this beautiful sepia um, image tones overall. Again, if you have black and white photographs from the 20th century in your family collection, this is most likely the process. In the second half of the 20th century, of course, color starts to take over, and the dominant print process becomes chromogenic prints. Um, chromogenic products are also available in negatives and um, positive slides. I'm not going to talk about film-based materials today, but we'll direct you towards a resource in that regard. Um, here, um, this paper now you can see there's another, a new layer, hopefully you can see this, at the bottom um, of the photograph. So on the back of the paper support, we now have a plastic coating, um, as well as the baryta at the top, and then three layers now, gelatin. Each layer has a different organic dye in it, one that's cyan, one that's magenta, and one that's yellow. When those three colors come together, we can make a positive full color image, like the prints you see in the album here. Um, so this is what we would call sort of a resin-coated paper. Um, this is introduced, this kind of paper is introduced in the second half um, of the 20th century. And so when you turn your chromogenic prints off over, they don't really feel like paper, they feel like plastic, um, because they do have this thin plastic coating, and it can, it can make it a little bit hard to write on, too, if you're looking to inscribe. But um, on that note, if you are looking to inscribe, always try to use a soft pencil if you can um, directly. And um, what I do find is people often think it's safer to work on a soft surface because um, you're putting your image image side down. But um, really what you want to do is work on a clean, hard, smooth surface so that you're unable to emboss or push into the print while you're writing an inscription. It's a little sidebar. Um, but chromogenic prints you you're probably certainly have in your home collections. You probably also have some instant color. Um, so the, the process name for these processes is dye diffusion. Um, this is an integral dye diffusion um, here in terms of the, the image of the little boy at baseball. Um, these are very complex materials um, because all of the chemistry required to expose, process, and develop the image is in that entire packet, right? Um, it's exposed in the camera, it comes out, and um, within a few minutes you have a full color image. So they're complicated, lots of plastic layers, um, organic dyes is the image material, and again now plastic support. Overall in terms of stability, I will say we're going to talk about chromogenic color fading. Um, dye diffusion um, prints have better dark storage. Um, they don't fade as much as some early chromogenic in the dark but they are susceptible to light damage, so you want to be particularly careful when displaying these materials. And finally, in terms of sort of contemporary processes, the inkjet process, this is one inkjet paper support. Um, again, the laminate structures for all inkjet prints are not the same because there are a wide range of papers that uh, people can choose from in terms of what they want to use, but what inkjet has in common is the image material here is an ink that may be dye or pigment based. Some prints will have ink that both includes both dye and pigment inks. Um, we have multiple plastic layers around still a paper support typically, um, but it, digital um, prints and inkjet can be made on a wide variety of surfaces. So you uh, might see things other than plastic or paper, like even metal. Depends on how creative you're being with your, your images at home. So there the goal is to sort of introduce, again, five processes that you're likely to have at home and give you a sense of um, the complicated nature of photographic materials, the diversity of materials present, um, the structure of these, these laminate systems, and um, know that when we're doing research on materials, photographic materials and image materials at IPI, we're studying all of these layers. Um, because, again, the vulnerabilities of each layer and, and how the layers interact with each other um, affects how we can care for them and preserve them long term. So now let's start to talk, oops, so resources. I keep forgetting those resource slides. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so if you want more information um, about digital prints, so we ended there with inkjet, 
Um, there are sort of three main processes um, in digital prints, um, inkjet, electrophotography, and dye sublimation. And for over a decade, IPI has done extensive research on um, the preservation needs of these materials. And all of that research has been summarized in this online resource called the Digital Print Preservation Portal, which we call DP3 for short. So I've, ha I've shared the URL for you here. If you're looking for additional information on digital print materials, this is your resource. In addition to DP3, we have um, a great web resource for print identification. So this is called Graphics Atlas, and essentially you can see across the top there, um, you can navigate around this website through a guided tour, as well as comparison and identification tools that will allow you to identify what photographs you have in your collection. Um, so if you think it's an albumin print but you're not sure, you can look through the identification and guided tour information about albumin prints and that will help you narrow it down. The identification um, pages also have tools where you can sort of describe the appearance of a print. Is the image tone purple? Is it black? Um, is the print yellow? And by selecting um, those features, the website will narrow down the you know, selection of processes it might be. So a great tool for, for um, identifying and understanding. And while I'm not going to talk about film-based materials today, many of you probably have film-based materials at home, um, be it film um, negatives or 35 millimeter transparencies, if you, if you have family members who took a lot of slides of, of family events and things like this. And um, our online resource, filmcare.org, is going to be your best source for understanding those materials and their long-term preservation needs. Okay. So now we're going to talk about some practical things you can do at home to care for your print collections. Jay, before you go into this, we do have one question. Do digital <coughs> images stored on CDs deteriorate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, CDs can be challenging because like photographs, they're actually laminate structures. So you have a plastic support, but then you have multiple layers um, present on that CD where the information itself is stored. And it's easy to scratch and abrade those layers and damage the information. And so um, my response is more about, yes, CDs can deteriorate because they're material objects, and all material objects can deteriorate over time. So um, the, what you want to focus on there is, again, caring for the CD in the best way that you can, preventing damage to the CD, and making sure that you have the hardware um, accessible to access that CD. Hope that helps. Okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about display. So if we're making prints, um, we make prints we might be storing them or making a photo book that we still have go on the shelf, but a lot of times we make prints that we can live with them, right, as well, and have them on display. And um, it's super to have images, family images, around the house. And I want to talk a little bit about some factors to consider while you're displaying your, your photographs at home. The first is um, where to display your photographs. And here we see sort of a living room setting. And you can see that the photographs are framed and displayed on interior walls. Okay, so the wall that's highlighted here is interior in that it, doesn't, it isn't exposed to any outdoor weather conditions because it doesn't represent the outside of the house or the building envelope in contrast to the wall to the right there that we see in the image. That's an exterior wall. So that wall is more likely to experience changes in temperature and maybe even in humidity, especially if you're in an older home that has plaster walls. Um, you may notice that those walls are cooler and damper when the outdoor weather is wet um, and cool. And so you want to sort of as much as possible display your, your photographs on interior walls and avoid walls that receive direct sunlight at any point during the day. So temperature and humidity are factors in terms of image decay. And we've looked at now that laminate structure of photographs, and we see that there's a very, very small amount of material. So they are susceptible to small changes or um, of high humidity and high temperature for long periods of time. So avoid direct sunlight as much as possible and choose interior walls when displaying. 
what are some of the effects we see of, of sunlight? If you take a look at this photograph on the left, this is a chromogenic print, so again, that dominant color process from the 20th century that was on display for a significant amount of time. And you can see at the outer edges where the print was protected by the rabbit of, a, of the frame while on display, and the middle of the image has faded significantly. So what's happened here? Overall, the image looks blue or cyan. That's because the magenta and the yellow image dyes have faded because of harsh light exposure. And unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to bring those colors back um, in this original print. It is possible to um, make a copy of the image and try to bring back the colors digitally to reintroduce magenta and yellow. Um, you're always sort of guessing at that, and it's not common in a museum setting. Um, but for family photographs, this is a nice way to retrieve images that have shifted potentially. In contrast, the image on the right that you see is also a chromogenic print. It's an earlier chromogenic print. Um, in part, earlier chromogenic prints also often have these white borders. And the earlier prints um, tend to be less stable. When we have chromogenic papers introduced in the 1980s, have um, much greater um, image stability. And those are the kinds of papers that are still being used today. But with these early papers, we have um, some what we call an inherent vice, where these organic dyes actually fade in the dark as well. So this print has faded not because of light exposure, like the image on the left, but in fact in the dark, um, because room temperature is very warm for these organic dyes. So they're active and they're actively deteriorating. So here, both the yellow and the cyan dye have faded, and what we're left with is a primarily magenta print. And so you may find that you have images like this in your collection that are early color family photographs. Um, Jay, we have another question. Uh, any suggestions for digitizing Kodak disc negatives? Huh. I'm not actually familiar with what a Kodak disc negative is, um, but in, uh, if you have film-based materials, film-based negatives, um, that you would like to access as positive, digitizing is certainly a good route to go because it's easy to convert those negative files into positive files, and then you can make prints from them. Um, I don't have particular resources for digitization. Um, scanning is okay. When you're digitizing prints, oftentimes they say, you know, you can do that with your digital camera. You don't have to buy a scanner if you want to make digital copies of older prints in your collection, um, but it is something you can do at home, and handling is going to be really important with these materials. Um, so making sure that you're handling materials with clean, dry hands, that you have a clean work surface. Um, if you are putting objects down on a scanner bed, um, plastics can generate a lot of static, right, charges, and so then um, particulates can adhere to those, and you don't want to be sliding your, your negatives around on um, a dusty or gritty surface that may scratch scratch or damage them. So we, we're getting a follow-up. Negative slides are easy. The Kodak disc is very tiny. <laughs> um, and I will say our, our questioner says that they're, he's, he's dating himself. Um, but we'll take this as a one-off. Yeah, and, and that's very true. Uh, yeah. Questions like this, Jay can, can uh, have a conversation offline uh, and give you a little more information. Right. That's great, Lydia. I'm happy to do that. And I have my email address available at the end of the presentation. Okay? okay. All right. So we're going to move on. So um, we have to think about the environment that we store and display our materials in. So we talked about choosing interior walls um, because they, they have less fluctuations in terms of environmental conditions. Um, we also need to be thinking about the materials that our, our photographs come in contact with. Because those um, photographic materials are sensitive to poor quality materials. So here you're seeing a very poor quality wood pulp paper, very acidic window mat that was in direct contact with this silver gelatin print, and it caused the silver to deteriorate um, underneath it over time. And so um, when you are filming your photograph, or I'm sorry, framing photographs, it's very important that you're selective about the types of materials you use. And we'll revisit this again when we talk about selecting storage materials as well. So um, some of the terms you can look for in terms of being an informed consumer when you're looking for um, framing materials are materials that are described as photo safe. This is an ISO standard term or as past the photographic activity test. 
any vendors that you may be considering purchasing materials from that cite the photographic activity test are well aware of the ISO standards that have been written to describe what requirements storage and display materials should meet to be in direct contact with photographs. So I want to point you to another resource in this regard um, from IPI's website. Um, this is a one-page reference about the PhotoSafe criteria for ISO standard 18902 that talks about, again, you can see that on the left, it's probably a little bit hard, but it shows a cross-section, a generic cross-section of a photograph and the kinds of um, reagents that can affect different areas of a photograph and what kinds of tests are done to administer whether or not materials would potentially cause harm, harm to photographs. So um, be looking for materials that are advertised or described in these ways. And talk to your framers. Um, that consumer guide about framing is going to talk to you a little bit more as well about questions to ask framers. Um, anyone that's really talking about museum quality, um, mat boards, materials like that um, for framing your photographs. Many of us photograph our, frame our photographs at home um, independently as well, right? There are a wide range of, of frame products out there. And a sort of common um, concern, if you will, of, of collections at home is oftentimes commercial frame packages are sold with glazing. It can be glass or it can be plastic inside a frame package that pressure mounts or, or requires the photographic print to be framed direct, in direct contact with the glazing itself. So here I have an example from my home. This is a classic um, do as I say, not do as I do <laughs> example where um, this image of my daughter that is um, in direct contact with glazing, hopefully you can see the gloss is a little bit different through the upper half of the middle of this print where it has adhered to the glass. So what's happening there? Um, this is a chromogenic print. Um, at some point in my house, the humidity was high enough where that thin gelatin binder became swollen and tacky. And because it was in direct contact with this smooth glazing, it adhered or stuck to it. So you begin to see this difference in color um, because the areas that are stuck to the glass become glossier and more saturated. But what happens is then over time, that print can pull away from the glass. And, and it actually begins to tear, right? So I think you can see these, these small torn areas here. And this is a very easy form of damage or deterioration to prevent. So let me show you um, how you can prevent this in a frame package at home. This is a, another cross-section then of a frame package here in the upper right. And um, in the left, a frame um, upside down with the glazing sitting in it. And so um, one of the most important aspects of a frame in terms of determining what you can do with your frame package is the rabbit. The rabbit essentially is the space that defines the overall thickness of the frame package. That's going to determine how much or how thick the materials you can put into the frame can be. And the width of the rabbit defines how much area of the frame overlaps um, the, the objects inside the package. So if you have an image that you want to frame that has image content all the way to the edges, um, this rabbit may be the only area that obscures or hides some of that image area. And to prevent your image from sticking to the glass, you can introduce a thin piece of archival board, um, so a thin piece of mat board or archival paper. And essentially, this acts like a spacer. I hope you can see this in the cross section at the right. This, this paper has to be thicker than the photograph itself, the print. And that then creates a gap, if you will, or a space between the photographic print and the glazing so that they can't get stuck to each other in, in poor conditions. An even better way to preserve or provide this sort of space is a window mat, because the window mat provides some additional width. Um, here, you have to worry about attachment. Um, I would say steer away from pressure-sensitive tape directly on your photographic prints um, or any kind of glue or adhesive. Um, photo corners, you can get um, polyester photo corners that are self-adhesive. These are like little pockets that can slide over the corners of your photographic prints and then be attached to the back mat um, where you would center the print in the opening of the window mat. And um, you've provided that additional space from the glazing and you haven't added any um, potential forms of deterioration caused by unwanted adhesives to the print itself. Those are some, 
some factors to consider in terms of framing and display. So we're going from make prints, display those prints thoughtfully, and now we're going to talk about factors to consider when storing your prints. So the main thing um, we're going to emphasize here is creating storage layers. And, and why do you want to create storage layers? Because um, no environment is perfect at home. Um, we, we have changes in temperature and humidity associated with seasonal changes, with opening the windows, um, maybe with leaving on vacation for long periods. And so by creating layers around our photographs, we provide um, additional protection with each layer. So um, essentially, when, when you have two or three layers of storage around your photograph, each of those layers has to be penetrated by any changes before the photograph itself will be affected. So we'll talk a little bit about how do you, you know, factors to consider in terms of storage and, and selecting materials. And I'll talk a little bit here about handling as well. In some cases, you may decide to store your photographs in groups, in envelopes or folders. And again, those thin image layers, those thin binder layers, um, they can be very susceptible to scratches or abrasions and even the oils on our skin. So as much as possible, you want to handle your photographs with clean, dry hands and not like the, the print on the left is being handled where you have your, image, your thumbs in direct contact with the image, but handling the prints from their edges as much as possible. That said, um, if you choose in what we call individual enclosures to put your photographs in, um, this allows you to handle photographs and look at them without handling the photographs themselves. And the same rules apply for selecting storage materials as selecting framing materials. You're going to want to look for products that are described as photo safe or as past the PAT. And here you have a box. These are some historic photographs in my collection at home. Um, this is um, packed the way you would ideally want to um, pack or, or store box. Largest prints on the bottom to smallest prints on top. And um, while you might have small prints in large envelopes, you still have, um, if your sleeve is the same size as the inside of the box dimensions, then those materials can't shift or slide around when you're moving the box. So that's something to consider. When you're looking at paper enclosures, paper enclosures are great. There are a wide range of, of paper enclosures available. This is called a four-flap enclosure, illustrated here on the left, typical for um, small negatives, things that um, maybe are a little more fragile and vulnerable because of the care you have to take to access them by opening each of these four flaps um, and then closing them. When you're looking at paper enclosures, you're going to want to look for materials that are described as acid-free. But acid-free alone is not the only term you want to look for. Um, acid-free is used on a wide variety of materials that may or may not remain acid-free long term. So the term you really want to look for is lignin-free. Lignin is the material in wood pulp paper that deteriorates over time and causes it to become acidic. And so that's a good, valuable term to look for in terms of being an informed consumer. And you also want to look for papers, materials that are colorless, that is, they don't have dyes added to them that could bleed or transfer um, to objects in the event of high moisture. In terms of plastic enclosures, again, if you're um, rehousing collections at home that you're going to handle frequently, I would advocate for plastic enclosures because, again, this allows you to look at, examine, access those images without having to handle the photographs themselves. And these three plastics, polyester, polyethylene, and propylene, are all archival and they're good choices for storing your photographic prints. One of my favorite types of sleeves, because you'll see there are a variety of sleeves. There are envelopes that are sealed on three sides. Um, there are some that are sealed on two opposite sides. This is called an L sleeve. Here, two adjacent sides are um, welded shut, so you can slide that photographic print into the corner safely, pick it up, and it's not going to fall out of the bottom or the side. Once you've got individual enclosures, this is sort of the ideal. Ideally, you have individual enclosures and then group enclosures. Some of us may only have group enclosures. That's okay, too. A box is, is sort of one um, form of a group enclosure. This particular box is called a metal edge box um, because it's held together at the corner by these metal brackets. And um, the metal edge box indicates that this is a box that has no adhesive involved in its construction. So it's just archival board and metal. 
no materials that are going to cause any harm to your photographs inside. It's a good choice for group enclosure. Other good group enclosures are albums. Um, we, we do a lot of these individual um, print albums at home because um, my kids are, are handling these prints. Um, but again, looking for those, you know, um, lignin-free is a key word. Those archival plastics, polyester, polyethylene, polypropylene are good um, choices for individual and group enclosures. And finally, um, I would advocate that you think about keeping your photographs together, um, your prints. So I um, store my photographs in plastic bins at home. Um, this provides an additional layer of protection from the environment um, and changes, also from pollutants. Um, some materials, especially um, certain digital processes, can be sensitive to um, pollutants in the environment. So again, we're creating these multiple layers to provide as stable and clean an environment as possible for our prints. And I think our hearts go out to everyone in California that has had to um, evacuate homes in recent days, um, unfortunately, but something to consider when you do store your prints together in a group like this and you have to leave home in a hurry, it is easy to, to pick up the collection as a whole and, and move it on. So in terms of stored spaces, where are you going to put these group bins? Avoid extreme temperatures and avoid extreme humidity. So you're not going to want to store your photographs in your basement. That's going to have high humidity, temperature extremes, especially in the winter, um, you're going to, in terms of coldness. And you're going to want to avoid your attics um, if they're unconditioned because you're going to have high temperatures in the summer. And again, high temperatures, high humidity can drive deterioration mechanisms forward and cause your prints to deteriorate more quickly than you want them to. Also avoid bathrooms. I know it sounds a little silly, but I've come across a fair amount of people that have photographs in their bathrooms at home. <laughs> and something to consider here, actually a recent story is um, moving, I guess, on to the next slide when we talk about um, what are good spaces. Good spaces are interior closets. So again, closets that don't have any external walls. Um, but I want to point out here, I have a colleague who recently shared an anecdote of um, a collection that was stored in an interior closet, but an interior closet that backed up to the plumbing of a bathroom. And um, there was a plumbing incident that caused a water emergency for that collection. So while interior closets are going to be ideal spaces um, for storing your photographs, you do want to be mindful of what's adjacent to those interior walls, too. Um, in, in some houses where we don't have the same kind of air conditioning all around, um, many people find that the bedrooms where we spend most of our time in the evening are kept the most stable, so a bedroom under the bed may be a nice place for your, your photographs in a, in a group enclosure or bin as well. So again, reiterating, we start sort of individual enclosures and making good decisions about archival materials, and then group enclosures, and then a nice stable environment at home that doesn't experience extreme temperatures or humidity. So those are my primary points in terms of taking care of your prints at home. Um, for those images that you know you want easily accessible long term, make prints. Um, think about how you're going to display them and avoid direct sunlight, um, avoid exterior walls, and in terms of storage, create as many layers as you can to prevent your prints from experiencing fluctuations. I did promise I would sort of circle back a little bit to electronic images as well, so I'm going to end there and say, if you're not interested in printing um, your prints, or you're going to, you want to um, preserve, ideally, both your electronic files and your prints, um, here's just a couple factors to consider in terms of electronic files. I would strongly encourage you to make sure that you're downloading your images from your phone to your computer. Um, put them on the computer someplace where they're easy to access, and make sure to organize and name those files. So one thing that making prints forces us to do is organize um, the images that we have in our collections. And, and we had a question earlier today about making photo books. Photo books force you to organize, and you provide context in a way, right, for these images once you organize them, and, and if you um, label them or mark them in a way that they will continue to have value for future generations. Why do we see family collections that end up in um, antique um, stores or perhaps, um, worse yet, in a landfill? Um, because future generations no longer have connections to those images. Um, they haven't been labeled and the context is unknown or, or, or no longer understood. So 
So be sure to, for your electronic files, organize them. And that might mean just downloading and including the year and an event, or um, the year and some people's names. Um, but if you can get in there and, and also name individual files, that will allow people going forward, including yourself, to search those files for specific people and specific events. And a good practice is to, once you have organized and named those files, make sure you store them in multiple copies in multiple places. In the event that something happens to your computer, you want to have a backup copy someplace else, maybe on an external hard drive, or maybe on a thumb drive, or maybe in both places. Again, so if something happens to any of these devices and they're no longer accessible for some reason, you have another copy to access. Jay, we do have a question. Um, doesn't cloud storage solve a lot of this problem? Yeah. So cloud storage, I think it's again, it's another, it's another option. Um, it's a, another copy, but I, I would still advocate that if you're storing in the cloud, make additional copies for yourself. Um, what will your long-term cloud maintenance be? Um, how are you organizing that? What will access be like? Um, that's harder for me to speak to, frankly. Um, what will your cloud access be in 50 years? Um, but um, I would say it's certainly a, a great option um, for storage and one of many, and, and I would encourage you to store in multiple locations. And a second question, um, do you have suggestions about storage of backups locally versus off-site? Meaning in yeah. your own home or right, right. use a service. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, um, you know, it's, I think it's up to you again. It's sort of the level of um, effort and expense you might want to put into it. But in, from an archive setting, the recommendation always is in multiple physical locations. So, again, if you have some sort of devastation or an emergency um, at home, um, like a house fire, um, that is extremely um, devastating and you, you lose all of the materials at home, the cloud gives you something else, right? It's another storage space or, um, you know, a copy maybe with another family member. I think, um, again, I sort of mentioned that every family typically has sort of the uh, family archivist. Um, sharing images, sharing um, uh, electronic files um, with others in the family um, is another form of backup or another copy, right? Um, and we have uh, one more question here. Is it okay to dry mount a gelatin silver print to the backing board before adding the overmount? <laughs> yeah, this is, I get this question um, quite a bit more from um, photographers and home collections. Dry mount tissue has come a long way, um, so it is very um, stable these days, the, the dry mount tissue that's available. Um, you can have um, damage in the dry mounting process because you are having to do that under extreme heat and pressure. So there are some risks associated with that, but in terms of long-term preservation, if the desired aesthetic is a very flat print, um, this is certainly an acceptable way to mount photographs. Okay. And we have one more question um, with regard to the uh, scanning versus taking a photograph of photographs. Mm -hmm. Are you advocating for taking photographs rather than scanning? Oh. Okay, um, I'm not advocating for one technique over the other necessarily, but suggesting that if you have a digital camera, which many people do, um, but you don't have a scanner and you want to create some digital images of tangible prints, um, just photographing them is a valid way of making those copies. Whereas if you are going to invest, you know, long term in scanning more kinds of materials, um, and you, you want to go the scanner route, that they're both acceptable ways of digitizing material, certainly. Perfect. Well, thanks to Jay for joining us today. Um, we will be taking a brief break until after the upcoming holiday. Uh, please bookmark the MeRIT website at rit.edu slash alumni slash MeRIT and visit the site to see a list of upcoming webinars as well as watching your email for our invitations. Thank you again for joining us.